we have nice food, we look for it for the body. We look for food for other sens senses, look beautiful things for our eyes, beautiful people, beautiful nature. We meet people, have nice talk with them, discussions, beautiful food for our mind. And we all love the best food, food for the soul, which is love. We all want to be loved. And we all want to love and be loved. Simple reason we have a soul. The soul wants no other food except love. Love to become an experience. If God made this world only to have experience of love, it would be full justification to create this world with all its problems and ups and downs included, that if you can have an experience of love, being loved and to love, greatest experience. But not love that arises from mental desire. Mental desire does not create love. Mental desire creates attachment. <coughs> attachment is not the same thing. We call it love. I love my children. Attachment. I love my house. Attachment. Supposing I love a person. I don't want to take names here. <laughs> Maybe there are too many. Anyway, supposing I say I love a person named A, just to give an example. If I truly loved A, I would never say I love A. I would be saying A, 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 A. What's the difference? My saying, I love A, or saying A, A, what's the difference in the two? When you say I love A, it's attachment. When you say A, it's love. That's the secret behind true love. True love puts the I out of the picture. Attachment brings it in the form. When you're attached to something, I love this thing. I is in the front. Not only in words, even if no words are used, when you're describing something you love, you say, I love that. What you are loving more than what you are describing is I. You love your ego so much that you can love somebody. It's a very big ego trip. If you study attachments, they're very big ego trips. They all have I very strongly in it. I love my flower, I love my car, I love my house, I love everything around me. Why, what am I saying? I love myself. <laughs> I am the one loving everything. It's a love of I. When you fall in love for the truly way, you forget the I. The beloved takes all the space. The I, I have tried to see, because people say ego is a big problem in spirituality. Books say, people say, masters say, saints have said, ego is a problem. Iness is a problem because Iness is creating all the separation. You remove Iness, you are with God. What is separating you? Iness, ego. I am separate. Whenever you use the word I, you become separate immediately. So separation is being created by the ego and love removes separation. It joins you together. It doesn't create more separation. And that is why the I disappears in true love and the beloved takes that space. So I go around the world, I travel and everybody's saying, I love this, I love that. And I say, where is true love? I want to hear people only mentioning the beloved. 
I hear saints mentioning only beloved and never mentioning I. I see masters praising the Lord and never saying there I am praising the Lord. They say, praise the Lord. I praise the Lord. No, praise the Lord. I disappears. So I have seen. But from experience, I have experienced totally unalloyed, <coughs> purest form of true love from my master. And I couldn't fully understand in the beginning why I was feeling like that. Why was I feeling that his love is different from anything I experienced in the world? It was as time passed, as I spent more time with him and more time I discovered his love never changed. His love was never based upon whether I love him or not. His love was never based upon my behavior, if I was a good boy or a bad boy. His love was totally unconditional. That's pure love. Totally unconditional, unchanging forever. I don't think all of us are in that state to be able to have that kind of experience of love that is unconditional. But perfectly living masters whose awareness has gone beyond the mind, they have that kind of love. What comes in the way of unconditional love, which we all have in our souls, all of us, what comes in the way is our own mind. The own ego or mind or separation. We separate ourselves so the love is not that part of our current awareness. We don't remember it, what true love is. When we are in the presence of a perfect living master, in just the presence we begin to feel something. And when we start thinking what we are feeling, it doesn't make sense. Feeling is still there. The feeling of love, unconditional love flowing from a perfect living master is so subtle. Because it is being felt not by our minds, but by the soul. The mind is questioning. The mind is doubting. I remember one intellectual professor who used to come to great master. He used to, he used to tell master, master, don't believe anything that you say. I don't accept this. This is all made up story. We are born here. This is the only life we lead and we die and everything is finished. He said, there's no evidence that anything exists beyond that. Everything else is made up. People say we remember old stories, our mind can make up anything. Just, I can't accept that there are higher levels of awareness, consciousness, and the soul. There's no soul, mind, or anything. It's just a human life with a brain that works, and when we die, it's over. Great masters used to say, you have your right, your opinion. I have a different experience, but you have your experience. And you go with your experience, I go with mine. It's just a matter of difference uh, in our life. He would say, Master, I don't want to hear any of that stuff that you talk. He said, no, I never force anybody to, to listen to me. You're welcome or not welcome as you like. It's only up to you. So after a week, he would come again. Master, I've come to tell you, I don't believe any other thing you say. And then next week again is there. And great master said, if you really don't believe what I say, why do you come to me every week? He said, that I don't know. Something wants me to come and spend time with you. Something makes me come and see you. But it's not your talk. It's not what you say. But something is happening that makes me come to you. Sign of pure love. Pure love is not felt by the mind. It's not the thinking mind that can even appreciate pure love. We can comment upon it very often or comments on love. Don't increase the experience of love. They destroy it. We have an experience of love with somebody and the mind starts thinking, can it be real? Am I not fooling myself? Thoughts can be negative and destroy experience of love with anybody. It's happening every day. People come to me, I found a soulmate. 
love so much. Both parties are there with me. We love each other like nobody's business. We have found each other. We were soulmates. We were made for each other. And after three months, they are back in a divorce court. I said, what happened to that made for each other stuff and that soulmate stuff? No, we knew from day one we were not made for each other. <laughs> so that's not what you said on day one. What happened? The experience of love was real. But the mind destroyed it. Because the mind has different values. The mind destroys love by a simple thing it does, which it's doing all the time, called expectations. Expects things. Expects too much. Everybody expects something. Expectation means disappointment. The more you have expectation, the more disappointments you feel. And that is why the disappointment in expectations is cancelling out a real, a real love affair that you had. And that's what happens. There was a lovely couple, Charles and Emily, I remember. They lived in Nevada, happily married. They fell in love so much. After marriage, when they began to take things for granted and didn't agree on small, simple things, no, this coffee is not hot enough. But it, you, you took the same coffee yesterday. I'm giving some simple examples. On small, small things, they would argue. Argument led to anger. Anger led to resentment. Resentment led that I'll not sleep with you tonight. I'll be in the other bedroom, okay? All kinds of things. And divorce. They divorced. And fell in love with it again. They felt so close to each other. A big mistake we made to get divorced. We were really made for each other. Nobody else like us that we can now find Remarried. Same people. Remarried. One day after marriage, argument started. C cut the long story short, divorced again. And to make a story even better, remarried third time. <laughs> it's a true story I'm telling you. <laughs> it happened. So I took up that as a case study. I said, let me see. When they are married, they want to break up. When they are not married, they want to be together. What is the difference? How come that when they are together, living together, married, they don't want each other. And when they are not married, they are so much in love with each other. What are the ingredients that create this kind of love and hate relationship? So I found out from my study that when you are not married, you put out your best face, best foot forward. When you're married, that's all withdrawn. You take life for granted. It's now a life to be lived for granted. That whole style of uh, dating is gone after marriage. And argument, too much argument is a great skill of the mind create a divorce. If you argue too much, it leads to divorce or separation or unpleasant living. There was a wise old man who gave a talk here. I also went to attend it. And he was also like a saint. So that is why people were worshipping him. So I also folded my hands to listen to him. And a young lady there in the audience said, I and my husband fight over petty things and we have arguments over everything. Want your blessing. Please bring some peace in our family. He said, I can do it. And there's a way I have a special mantra for that. You bring a bottle of water and I'll uh, speak the holy words of mantra and bless the water and it'll resolve your problem. And so she said, all right. She brought a bottle of water and he chanted some mantras and blessed it. And she said, how often should I give it to my husband? He said, no, it's not for your husband, it's for you. But I'll tell you the manner in which it has to be used, the special method of using this water. 
when your husband starts an argument, you open the bottle and take a sip. But don't swallow it. Keep it in your mouth. <laughs> hold the bottle. While he's arguing, you hold the bottle. If he stops, swallow it. <laughs> if he starts again, take another sip. There'll be no problem. Peace will be restored. Now, such a simple thing he suggested, and still we argue so much. Why do we have to argue so much? Somebody sent me a cartoon of two professors, no, one professor and one wise man, the holy man, they're walking together. And the professor says to the holy man, please tell me the secret of happiness. He says, secret of happiness is not to argue with idiots. And he said, I can't agree with that. He said, you are right. <laughs> he said, you are right. So there are so many examples of this, how our mind interferes in our spiritual life. Because I truly believe a life of pure love is a spiritual life. Because it comes from the spirit, it comes from the soul. A life where you feel loved and can love is a spiritual life. And we destroy it by too much argument, too much interference by the mind. Mind was not designed for that. Mind is not designed. Mind is not designed for love. Mind is designed to create desires and from desires, attachments. That's all it is. The mind is given an experience which we take as real. Understand, the functioning of the mind is so simple that you are using an equipment in your head which creates sense perceptions. You can see, touch, taste, smell, all those things you can do because of your own head. Your own brain has created that. And your mind then uses these sense perceptions to perceive things, objects, people, and takes them to be real. Separates them as if it is not part of the mind, but part of separation. If the mind were really clever, it would know it's all created by the mind. Mind is not clever enough for that. Mind is only interested in the experience generated outside and therefore gets attached to the experience, desires something and desires more. And then when desires are there, it causes attachment. If you don't get the desire fulfilled, you're disappointed, you're attached. Attachment pulls you back again and again. A great device to perpetuate the drama. And it's perpetuating because of that. We are all here again and again, lifetime after lifetime, just because of this fact. Attachment, desires, attachment, desires. Gautam Buddha was the one who spoke most, most strongly about it. The only thing that's holding us back is our desires and attachments. But the mind was designed for that, to make this world real, to make it look real. If there's nothing real, how would you be desiring it or attaching it? How is it made real? By completely shutting down the process through which experience takes place. The assumption is, this world exists for a long time, billions, trillions of years. We have come for a little while here. One day our turn will come, we'll die, world will go on. Maybe we'll come again or not. That means what is permanent? World, not us. Absolutely the opposite from the truth. The truth is this is all created. And the self that's observing it is the only permanent thing. The rest is all created. The truth is completely different from what we are experiencing here. That's why we are trapped here. But the mind was designed to do that. When we are in a dream state, dream looks real to us. At that time, we don't feel that we are creating a dream. We are participating as a being, human being in a dream. We run around, we go to places, we meet people. We suddenly at one place, suddenly another place doesn't look unnatural to us. All laws that we are used to seeing in the physical wakeful world are destroyed 
and we are beginning, beginning to accept the laws of a dream world. And nobody questions in a dream how in one moment I was in New York, when I'm in Chicago, in one minute it looks natural. We jump from buildings and don't get hurt in dreams. We have all kinds of different rules and yet we take it as all real. The only moment when we say it's not real is when we wake up and find we created it. That's the only time when you wake to a more wakeful state. Same thing is true of this world. When you wake up, you'll find you created it. But till then, it's, it's becoming real. To be shut off from your wakeful state, to get into a dream state, is a secret to create reality. If you could remember that you are awake when you're dreaming, it'll be a daydreaming. It won't look real at all. You have to shut off this state of wakefulness in order to make a dream reality. Same thing is being done here. We don't look like this till we wake. When we wake up, we discover the same truth about this physical experience also. You have a dream in which you see an old castle built 3,000 years ago and a sky that has been little reddish color sky and you ask the guide, how come the sky is red? Oh, it's been red for millions of years. Oh, that's wonderful. And you wake up and find that you slept for three minutes. In three minutes, you discovered a 3,000 year old castle. And you discovered a sky, a red sky, which was created millions of years ago, disappeared in three minutes. How could you create millions of years in three minutes? A dream can stay, do that. This world's billions of years and trillions of years are created in the same way. This world is created in the same way. When you wake up, you'll see that. It's just a question of waking up. Which means that I am part of your dream, speaking to you in a dream, but telling you something of wakeful state. How can one do that? I remember a man who was sleeping and he had horses. So in the dream, he's leading his horses. He's holding two horses and carrying them. His friend who's awake is sitting next to him. The friend, he says, wake up. He's still dreaming. He can hear his friend's voice. The friend speaking, saying, wake up. He says, but who will take care of my horses? The friend says, I'll take care of your horses. Friend knows there are no horses. But he says, I'll take care of your horses. What is he doing? He's participating in the dream of the person sleeping. He says, okay, and he wakes up. And he doesn't ask, where are the horses? He can't say, friend, you are a liar. You told me you'll take care of my horses. And why don't you take care of my horses? He says, if there are any, I will. You created them, I just participated. What's the difference? One was awake, one was sleeping. That's the only difference. The wakeful one, could give a nudge. Sometimes they get a nudge. Nudge of love from a master. It comes, gives a nudge. Yes, there is something to it. How can he give a nudge to us? We don't even see him when he gives a nudge to us. Let's go and see him. Why? Why do you want to see him? What for? Some nudge is coming. Why? Because he's giving a nudge. We are sleeping. He's awake. So these things happen and we discover gradually the truth of the whole thing. How the creation has taken place. There was a great dancer in India and she was a follower of Mahatma Gandhi also. And then she set up a big dance school and I was in a certain job where she, she invited me to come and talk to the girls who were dancing. So I went and gave a talk and then she invited me for a cup of tea. We were talking about Indian scriptures and how they describe reality and so on. At the tea party, she says, I want to understand the word Maya used in scriptures, which means illusion. And this word is illusion. She said, doesn't look like illusion to me. Does it look like illusion to you? I said, no, looks very real to me. She said, why do, they, why do the scriptures call it illusion? Why is this physical world with which we are living, which is so real, and if you don't know the reality, pinch yourself. 
it'll be real. If not, let somebody else poke you with a needle, as you know it's real. There's nothing that makes it more real than pain. And we all have painful experiences, and that, that certifies it's real. If it's so real, how can the scriptures call it illusion? Illusion means unreal. She said, explain to me. So I explained to her. I said, we are just going to have a cup of tea. I picked up my cup. I said, you pick up your cup and we'll have a cup of tea. Did you see the cup? Yes. Did you taste the tea? Yes. Did you like it? Yes. Was the cup and tea real or not? They were real. I said, all right. Now let's take the same example. We have a dream. In the dream, we are in the same place now. In the dream, we also have a tea party going on. And I am saying to you in a dream, now pick up the cup and look at it. Yes. Taste it. Yes. Good tea. Very good. And then we wake up. Will the cup be there? No. What will be there? Taste of the tea will still be there. What is the correct interpretation of the word Maya? Experiences are always real. They are not illusion. That say jump from the experience and the objects creating the experience is real, that's the illusion. The illusion is our jumping from an experience and saying because the experience involves objects that we can perceive with senses, the sense perceptions are creating objects and people for us. They have to be real because experience is real. Experience is never unreal. That is why the word Maya is misunderstood. It's not illusion. It is the experience generating an, an illusion. The experience is always real. I, I hold those little exercises in my meditation workshops where I say, imagine that you are having seeing flowers, you are seeing this. All people, half the people at least have that experience. I ultimately say, taste a little snack of yours. In a meditation, imaginary state. And they taste the snack. When they, this is over, the experiment is over, I ask them, is the taste of the snack still in your mouth? They say, yes. There was no snack. Taste was real, snack was not. That's the illusion. The illusion here is, we have generated real experiences, sensory experiences. Scientists are very bothered nowadays because they always, their empirical science was based upon an objective reality outside. But they are now very troubled because of some recent discoveries. One was, of course, the quantum mechanics discovery that when there is a wave and you look at it and measure it, it becomes a particle. How can a human, a human being look, change a wave into particle? If it does, it is creating matter out of energy. If it can, are we all creating all the matter we see around, which was originally energy, and by our looking at it, it's becoming all matter? Is that a human role? This is not a metaphor, a metaphysical thing, it's physics. Physics is telling this today. So that's why the role, even Einstein, before he died, his last observation was, I did not give the importance to the role of the observer in all my observations. What the observer was creating, because he had discovered in his own time that the quantum physics was based upon a, a human being using something and changing it. I recently spent some time with these software people in California. And I was talking to them about the new development of quantum computers. Have you heard of quantum computers? The new computers are coming up, they'll be called quantum com computers. A computer is normally using a binary language of zero and one. Everything in the world, music, talk, writing, pictures can be expressed in a language of zero and one. Great discovery. All our phones, all our computers, all our all desktops, everything is working on that principle today. Two digit language, actually not two digits, one digit language. 
We are told it is zero and one. It's not really zero and one. It's one absence of one, one absence of one. Zero is merely an absence of it in electrical charge. If you study how a chip is manufactured, you will find where a current can go through is one. But resisted is zero. That's how they're making the circuitry. So that is why it's only one digit. One. And everything can be explained with one now. Now, what is a quantum computer going to do? Currently, the program is written zeros and ones, and they stay steady. What is zero is zero, one is one. That's how the program works. Modern future computers will have the ability, the intelligence, artificial intelligence, built into the program by which the computer will decide on human observation to change zeros into ones and ones into zeros and modify the program completely based upon the application. It's amazing. When you look at these things, you realize how human observation is creating changes in everything around. More and more will come out. You'll, you'll watch what is going to come out later, connecting physics so much with spirituality, never seen before. They can't help it. They are also going to find other problems that have been taken for granted. Einstein came and dismissed Newton altogether. Gravity is not what you thought it was. The apple didn't fall to the earth because earth was big and the apple was small. Einstein said apple fell because there was too much matter here. And the matter had created a curvature in space. And when space is curved, things fall in it. And it was a curved space, so apple had to go along the curve onto the earth. Nobody could understand it. I, under I hear that there were 50 people, 50 scientists working with him when he gave a talk explaining this relativity. And when he explained it, all the 50 looked blank. Then one man got up. He said, I got it, sir. I got it. And then he sat down and said, I got it. Now I don't have it. <laughs> Such new notions he brought about. And he'll be completely thrown back when the new discoveries come. And you see the biggest being a notion that has been accepted for so many years that they, we are an expanding universe. You heard that? That this is world is expanding universe and how they calculated it? Because they look at the galaxies, they look at far, far off stores, good, good uh, telescopes. Good telescopes that work much better outside the Earth. The atmosphere of the Earth is a too much of a block for good telescopy. So they use good telescopes on other planets and so on, on other stars, wherever they don't have a telescope there yet, on created satellites. They put the telescopes and they're putting further. Hubble is there, Chandra is there, one more has just come up. So they're putting these telescopes to see far. They have a problem. They can't see far. Because what they see can only be seen after the light from that place comes to us. Light travels at a fixed speed, 182,000 miles per second or something. And therefore, supposing they see something one light year away, we are not seeing what is there, we are seeing what was there one year ago. If we are seeing something which is one billion light years away, we are not seeing what is here now, we are seeing what was there billion of years ago. How did they know the world is expanding? Because when they measure the stars, every year they go further away, on all sides. And the distance at which they travel in a year, is the rate at which we are expanding. Space is expanding. So they just reversed it. It's expanding at this rate. Let's go back and say contraction. Oh, we've come to the conclusion 13.4 billion years ago, the zero point singularity was there. And that's when the expansion started. Just reversing the rate of expansion, putting it back into contraction. A problem is coming up and will come up in a big way. I'm telling you today, the further the telescopes go, they are not going back further in 
space. They're going further in time. And the current calculation that the Big Bang took place in 13.4 billion years ago will totally be destroyed when they have a telescope looking 13 and a half billion years ago and find a bigger universe than this. Every time they go and look at the space, there's a bigger universe. More galaxies they find every time. There should be less. If you're going back in time, there should be fewer and expanding. How come when we're going backwards, we are finding more? It appears the world was much bigger when it started. How can you call it a big bang and expanding universe? These problems are going to come up. We can see them. They don't see it yet. They will see it. We just need bigger telescopes, better telescopes. So I'm only telling you how this whole illusion of creation will have to be touched upon by physics as much as by spirituality. Both will have to study the same way. Because this is, they're going to raise so many questions. Already there are too many questions in nature which cannot be answered. And these will be more questions which they have taken for granted some answers to them. They'll be upset. I believe there are a few questions which scientists don't have but some of you have. <laughs> and I can take up a few now. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and teachings. With respect to the matter of reincarnation, are you saying that our past lives are drawn not from physical cells floating around, but from the infinite cosmic conscious one that we all spring from? The question is, is reincarnation based upon our physical lives here? or the origin. No, it's neither here nor origin, in between. What is in between? To understand what is in between, you have to understand that the coverings upon our soul are creating different levels of consciousness. This is a physical consciousness we are living in, physical world. If we don't have a physical body, we still have a consciousness and a body which has got all sense perceptions intact. It's a different type of life. But you can't call that life the same as physical. It's a different type of life where you have all sense perceptions. You see, touch, taste, smell, but have no physical body, no physical matter, nor does the physical astral world have any matter at all. We don't have matter, they don't have matter. In transition between the two, there's an overlap. Because these structures in space-time are constructed in such a way that if you look in the direction, measure it, let's say measure space here, in every direction, it's infinite. Okay? Infinity on all sides. If the measurement is the equal on all sides, it becomes a sphere. Basic mathematics, that if something is infinite or something is 10 feet or something is any number of miles, the length from your position in all directions, if it is the same, it becomes a sphere. It's an infinite sphere, which we can understand. It's an infinite sphere. The further we go, there's still more. That's infinity. Okay. What about the astral stage of consciousness where we don't have a physical body, but we have ourselves there in a body that has sense perceptions and a world that has got all things to see, touch, taste, smell, but no matter. How big is that? Infinite. Now, that infinity is bigger than this infinity. How can infinity be bigger? Infinite means the end. The end can be bigger. The basis of that is we are using the word infinity in terms of sense perceptions. Infinity means as far as you can go. Then you go further, then as far you can go. Infinity ends where you can't go any further. There you can go further. Therefore, this bigger infinity. But it's also a sphere. These two spheres overlap. And when they overlap, you know, when a big sphere of space overlaps a big sphere of super space, they create a overlap 
which looks like a fish, makes the form of a fish, sorted from all four sides. Then, supposing we leave the inner garment also and go to the next where there is no sense perception, only perception, which is the mind. It can perceive everything, does not have to touch, taste or smell. There's also a level of awareness and that form has gone, but we are still there, the self. What is it? Also a sphere. The ability to go far is so much there. It's a huge infinity, much bigger than these two infinities. Second overlap. And second overlap creating a second fish. This knowledge that this is how consciousness can operate at different levels has been referred to as the knowledge of the two fishes. I heard people reading the Bible say Jesus Christ gave two fish to 50,000 people. And they are thinking he caught fish from the pool and might have broken it into pieces. 50,000 people? He gave knowledge. Knowledge of the inner self. That's what the two fish refer, represents. The overlaps perform a strange function that when you are in the overlap, first overlap, person dies, he's still connected to the world which, which only senses can operate, no matter. Also connected to the world with senses, so can haunt people, can be still felt by people, led people, can haunt houses, so on, and can try to reach us, but can't because we can't see, we can't hear. But still there. Many people feel that the dead person is there, but we can't see, can't feel, because of the overlap. When we talk of different levels, where did this reincarnation business come from? It did not come from the top, where there is no time space. It did not come from the physical level. We have no control over where we will be born again. It came from the third level, causal level. The causal level where the mind generates everything, where destinies are manufactured. And they are manufactured at top speed. And they are made into the form, because I have no words of the form used there, I use the local physical word, DVDs. What is a DVD? A programmed life. Okay? Programmed life, you play it, you see the whole life. If you don't play it, it's on one piece. There is no time involved in holding a DVD in your hand. But you play it, it becomes timed. So we have our destinies prepared in no time, like a capsule, like a DVD, at the causal plane, which we play here. Reincarnation is all included in those DVDs. Reincarnation is built into those DVDs because the programming of the DVD is you cannot put an event here if there is no cause. And if a life has to be created from birth, there should be cause for that too. Where you are born, rich or poor, which country, which location? How do you determine that? Where is the karma to be put in? Where is the cause to be put in for your place of birth? So the DVD of a single life contains the contents of a previous DVD. There is no previous DVD, just the contents. It says recap. Recap previous DVD. And the previous DVD can't be created by itself. Recap. Infinite recaps. Infinite futures, only one DVD. We come here for one life. You can't have one life without cause. Cause is previous life. First life you ever came, you never lived a past life. How did you come? The notional recap was there. And therefore, you remembered your old life. You could remember, which you never lived. But once you start staying here, then you create real lives and you don't go back. When you go back, you destroy everything and discover the DVD. So it's as simple as that. Therefore, reincarnation is part of the destiny that is made in the causal plane. And it's not the floating around of other human beings or, or astral souls. It is manufactured at the causal plane where the mind generates all destinies. And all that I'm saying can be checked up by any one of you, including the questioner, by going into the causal plane. It's as simple as that. You might wonder why I'm making it look so simple. I'm making it simple, not easy. I don't use the word easy. I say simple. 
the truth is it is very simple to go within is very simple just forget the body forget this thing and go in that's all why is it not easy attachments desires are attachments only are stopping it mind mind is the only thing coming in the way on a very simple process of discovering yourself so that is why most of the talks that these masters are giving us are to the mind do meditation try hard try more we oh, all i'm trying very hard i'll try even more they don't tell you the truth trying will never give you anything <laughs> it's not a it's not a game of trying it's a game of something which you've forgotten it's a game of love it's a game of love can pull you it's that different game altogether but you want to understand it okay understand it work hard how to pull your attention inside do heavy meditation do more follow the strict diet lines follow this rule follow all the rules so that you can get something inside all this is directed to our minds mind love it not only love it they want it they won't do without it they won't accept anything without it why they have been trained without struggle you get nothing without effort nothing can be attained that how can we attain something without effort on spiritual side it should be the same rule it's not the same rule there is a rule mental rule mental three realms imagine not only here three realms exist physical astral causal where effort works where effort is part of karmic patterns effort is part of destiny and it works to create results of its own kind but what takes you beyond the mind is something that pulls you from beyond the mind where no effort exists there no mind exists but love exists masters pull us by their love they make us do meditation for our mind it's a truth nobody wants to hear from me <laughs> people even challenge me for that why are you telling people that meditation won't take you anywhere love will take you everywhere and then you ask people to meditate i say i tell them the truth they can't digest it so tell them the other thing <laughs> it's simple the truth is not what our mind is trying to understand our mind is working differently our mind wants to struggle want to find achieve something i has to rise i will go there i'll go to my true home when the i goes to true home i is left on the way half half way there no i there this is amazing game but anyway i'm very happy to tell you that the discovery how destiny is made is can be done by going to causal plane all destinies are made there and there is a game for these three levels and no more a reincarnation is part of that and that is why it's built into our destinies but at different levels we experience it differently in physical world we say we have past life when we say past life we are not talking of non physical only talking of another physical past life when we are in the astral plane past life is astral past causal past life is like a mind another mind but the lives are very different in physical space time times are different but let us use physical space time this physical world we are in one body not a very long time 100 years not even 100 most people die earlier than 100 some will live little longer they some will live to 120 will become normal after some time uh, and 135 is the maximum they have found out they used to think we can live 200 years 300 years it's all nonsense they have found the bio biological condition of the human body will not allow it to live beyond 135 they place a limit now it has to under the process of aging go out so but in the astral plane in pure sensory perceptions we can live thousands of years average will be 2000 3000 years of physical time same being same self will live that long we can remember things 1000 years ago we can't remember things that happened 10000 years ago in the astral plane for we were born there when we go to the next level we can remember even further that that mind's life is about 3 million years physical time so mind can go back millions of years but not 10 million years it wasn't there 
in the soul has generated the whole mind and everything. The capacity is immortal and infinite. That's true, true way of having total knowledge, total awareness at this whole level. So these are different levels at which we get different answers to our questions. There's one more question. If we are all capable of withdrawing our attention and shifting our awareness, is initiation really a necessity on the path? We are all capable of withdrawing our attention and going back to our origin and discovering the truth. Why are we not doing it? We are all capable. What is stopping us? There should be something. We are all capable, all knowing ourselves, all wanting to go there to our true home. Why aren't we doing it? Because we do not believe. We don't believe this stuff. This is the only thing we can believe. Our reality is what we can see here. Somebody can impress us by talk, conversation, by books, so on. There is something more and we want to be convinced because we don't want to die. We want to live in some other form if possible. Various reasons are there in our reasoning, but there's no way we can do anything. How can we find out this capacity that we can go all in? All of us have it. We are not doing it. Something is missing. What is missing? A faith or belief in a friend whom we believe that he is a friend, genuine friend, who tells us you can do it. When that friend comes into our life, we do it. We don't do it otherwise. The mind won't let us do it. We are too, too distracted by enjoying and suffering the environment around us. Sometimes enjoying, sometimes suffering, sometimes combination. And that's involving all our time and life. And we, with all the capability of discovering, are not doing anything. People tell us, oh, there is this thing. We go to, we believe in religion. Religion influences us. Spiritual talks influence us. There is something beyond. How do we get it? Go within yourself. It's all inside. Okay, we'll try. Close our eyes. Do they call this darkness enlightenment? At least when I, I, my eyes are open, I can see the world. They're telling me, close your eyes to see yourself. I see darkness, nothing else. So it's all dark inside. How can I find enlightenment? I give up. And their friend didn't know anything. He just, he's just a believer in something. Fake, fake believer. Fake believer, fake masters, fake gurus. All are fake. Because when I closed my eyes, I saw darkness, nothing else. I will stop. Then, how can we possibly use the potential each one of us has to withdraw attention and find the truth inside when everything that we are doing is leading us to disappointment and not taking us in? What is the solution? Solution is somebody comes into our life, appears to be a friend, if not on the first move, Second, third, fourth. Appears, friends, something makes us feel good in his or her company, which is the sign of love that you feel good in somebody's company. And something is pulling us from inside and making us feel that he can give us something. And he then he talks that you can go and withdraw attention on. Okay, how is it done? He says, You can do it this way. Let me try it seriously. But I see darkness. No, you won't see darkness. Do it in a certain way. So we start following. Depending upon how much that friend knows, by personal experience, he takes us there. But what has taken us is a feeling of love and belief, faith in that person to start with. How far that person can take us is as far as he has experienced. That is the birth of gurus. Masters, they are friends. They come and tell us, do this, you will get this. When we have faith enough, we try it. And sometimes we get it, sometimes we don't. Depending upon whether we are taking them seriously or not. So, 
which means because of the different levels to which we can rise to find our ultimate self, they can be different. So many levels of masters who can come in our life. And they do. Sometimes several masters come, taking us different stages. Some merely create the curiosity for it, and some take us to stage one. When we are not satisfied, we want something more, something is pulling us more. Another master comes, takes us further, and so on. When a perfect living master arrives to take us to a true home, which is the origin of, the, of this universe, true home where we really belong, where we are here today, from where we are experiencing this physical world and all other worlds, which is our true home. Very rare experience, very rare masters. Why? Very rare people seeking it. Most of the people are seeking things from this world. Some are seeking heavens, which are in the astral plane. Hardly anybody, very few people are seeking to go to a true home, to the origin. When they are seeking, a perfect living master appears. How does he find us? How can he know, a human being, how can he know where a particular seeker is sitting and seeking him? He can never know it as a human being. But if his awareness is at the top, he knows everything, everybody. He knows all the souls. He knows they are all part of himself. They are all dispersed according to his himself. And he knows now the time is right for that part to come. And he appears. Destinies are even created at a lower level than that person's awareness. That's a perfect living master. He appears in our life when we are ready to go to our true home, ultimate. And when he comes, what does he use? For our body, he says, be careful, be healthy, eat right, eat this. Body, physical body. Sensory perceptions, don't get too involved in things that will hold your attention here and will distract you forever. And you'll be held back, you won't even lose the desire to find yourself. Don't do that. For the mind, he says, don't think too much. If you think too much, I'll give you some words to repeat. So repeat the words. They take away your time of thinking. So you think less. Ultimately, keep on repeating. So you won't think. And when you don't think, you'll experience something more. What is that? Love and pull of that master. When that is experienced, he pulls you through all this, it takes you. And acceptance by that human being who appears in our life at the right time when we are ready to go and feel we want to go to our true home, that acceptance is called initiation, a perfect living master. That is why initiation is needed. Without that, we'll fall even from the first three, four steps, won't go. So initiation is not teaching how to meditate. That can be done by any master. It can be done from books. You can read books and know how to meditate. Initiation by a perfect living master is an acceptance by one who is operating as your own real self. It's just a projection of your own real self. If the whole world is illusion, he can't be real. He's also a projection in the same level of reality that you're creating. No more. But how he appears in your life is because in this state, you're ready to go back to true home. He appears and says, I'll accept you. <clears throat> what is the meaning of initiation? Initiation means I will take you to my true home. You think we are separate. I'll take you to the point where you believe we are one. And not only believe, you know it. That we are one. Then we say promise. He said promise. Are you a promise breaker? I have met many promise breakers. This one is not a promise breaker. If he is a promise breaker, not a perfect living master. A perfect living master, once he initiates a promise, he will take us to a true home, a promise never broken. That's what's a very big thing. The initiation by a perfect living master guarantees. If it's guaranteed, should we still meditate? If he is guaranteed, that depends on the level of faith. Maybe he might drop us on the way. <laughs> then meditate. Maybe I can't see him very often now enough to find all the questions and maybe I should try myself. Okay, meditate. There are so many factors in our life which lead to doing things which are for the mind. Meditation has never taken anybody 
ever be on the mind because it's a mental process. Remember this. You won't hear it from too many people. They think that meditation takes us to a true home. I'd like to see one person like that. Their true home is universal mind. That's what they made true home, where the destinies are being created, is true home. Not where this whole is, nor where, where which we really belong. Not where there's no one but one out of which many are existing right now. So that is why it's very important when we are ready and we get this opportunity to get initiated by a perfect living master. It's the biggest thing that can ever happen in our total career as a soul, not as a human being. Even as a soul, no matter we have it, millions of lifetimes, it's the best thing that can happen. Sometimes there are people who come and get initiated. I remember that master would initiate and they said, Master, I can feel it. It's after several lifetimes of waiting, this moment has come. Which is true. It's actually true. So initiation by a perfect living master is the best thing that can ever happen. And it's very rare because seekers of that level are very rare. And when they get it, they can get initiated from the level, levels of masters, leading to different levels. But I'm talking of initiation by a perfect living master. It's rare but the best thing that can ever happen. Thank you very much for joining me today. Next month we'll meet again. Until then, what should I say? Meditate more. <laughs> Thank you.